You know, sometimes the name of a parsha, every time, but sometimes we can concentrate more or less, more or less than, than other times. The name of the parsha, of this parsha, Bechukotai, is so much in the name. First of all, the name parsha Bechukotai means in my laws. But laws have a few expressions in Hebrew. Mishpatim is laws. Eidut is laws. Mitzvot is laws. Chukotai is laws. That there is every name has a, a specific, more specific meaning. There is three types of mitzvahs within Jewish law. Mishpatim are mitzvahs that make sense, like honoring your father and mother, um, not to kill. The Talmud says if not for the Torah was given, we would learn uh, modesty from a cat and not, and not to rub, rubbery, not to rub from an ant, the ants. Then there is mitzvahs that we don't have, we don't need God for it. I don't know your father. Everybody knows. Then there are mitzvahs who are called eidut. Eidut means testimonial mitzvahs. These are mitzvahs that without God I wouldn't do them, but after God told me to do it, I know why. It makes sense. For example, keeping Shabbat. Why we keep Shabbat? I wouldn't start come up with an idea of keeping Shabbat. But after God says it's to remember that God created the world in six days and rested on the seventh day, it makes sense. Eating matzah and Pesach for seven days, I wouldn't come up with the idea on my own. But after God says it, it makes sense because the seven days we left out, we left Egypt from the from the Exodus until we the splitting of the sea, makes sense. That's mitzvahs, that our testimonial mitzvahs are called. They make I wouldn't come up with them, but after God said it, it makes sense. Then there is mitzvahs that completely don't make sense. They are called chukim. Chukim is mitzvahs that are like the circumcision. What's the logic behind circumcision? Don't no really that. Not to eat milk and meat. Kosher. All of kosher really don't make sense. Keep explanations and here and there, but the bottom line is it's a hook. It's above logic. And there is all more and more things above logic. Chukotai, Chukim, stands for the word that meets us that are above logic. That when the Torah says, Bashas Bechukotai, Bechukotai Telech, we should walk in my laws, it means that God wants us that even the mitzvahs that make sense, well, I'll ask a question, what people do more, quicker, mitzvahs that make sense or mitzvahs that don't make sense? What do you think? The ones that don't make sense. What do you think? Uh, I think that we do that uh, what we think makes sense. We do more. Right. You're right, on a simple level, you're right. On a other level, you're right. Look, mitzvahs that make sense, not to steal. Everybody knows how many people observe it. On the other hand, fasting and Yom Kippur doesn't make sense. It's, ab it's, it's above logic. Yom Kippur. Everybody's doing Yom Kippur. In a strange way, circumcision and Yom Kippur is more observed than, mi than most of the mitzvahs that make sense. Charity makes sense. How many people don't do it? All the mitzvahs that make sense about agricultural mitzvahs in Israel, nobody, many people don't. Mitzvahs that don't make sense, actually people do it. Why? Because then it makes sense why people look for a reason for the mitzvah. They try to find a way out of it. The reason why we keep, uh, we keep they try to give an explanation for keeping kosher. Why? Because then it was hygiene. They needed to, now we don't need it because we have refrigerators and we have this. Then whenever you look for a reason for the mitzvah, it's not because you want to do it with more excitement, as before, because you want to find a way out. The moment you have no reason, you're stuck. God said so. What? I don't know. I can't. I can't. There's no way. If there is an explanation, I can twist it around. There's no explanation. I cannot twist it around. Then the Torah tells us we should do the mitzvahs that make sense with the same commitment that we do the mitzvahs that don't make sense. Why? Why I need to honor your father, my, my father and mother, as a way, as, as, I, as I, am I committed to the mitzvah of Brit Mila, circumcision or fasting on Yom Kippur? What's wrong? Should I do it because it makes sense? I like it. I love my father and my mother. I understand that I have to honor them. It makes sense. Why I need to do it with this commit commitment? 
What will be missing in my mitzvah if I only do it because it makes sense? Why God is expecting of me, as Hasidus explains it, I should be committed to every mitzvah that makes sense, not because it makes sense, but because God said so. Why I need the component of God said so in this mitzvah? Because there is many reasons why not to honor my father and mother. He abused me. He abandoned me. He does me. He shmoes me. Excuses we have from here until next year. Then we go to the psychologist and we sit 20 years by the psychologist because my father told me this and I couldn't get over it. That if you do the mitzvah of honoring your father and mother because it makes sense, you will find all his reason not to do it. Excuses not to do it. But when you do it because God said so, God said so. No argument. Yeah, he abused you. All nice and fine. I have an explanation for it too. I tell people, oh, you're angry with your father. Yeah. Is your life worth anything? Or you want to commit suicide? As long as you're not ready to commit suicide, it means that your father gave you a gift. It's called life. And you have to respect him. So he wasn't so nice to you when you were seven years old or 17 or 27 and you want to get a job. Then this is why the Torah tells us, Bechukotai, the name of the parasha, first of all, tells us, we observe the mitzvahs because God said so. The testimonial mitzvahs that makes us say the mitzvahs make sense. I get up in the morning, why do sun? Because God said so. Later I try to understand, I try to, everything is nice and fine. That's one level of understanding the word Bechukotai. My chukim, my laws, they don't make sense. There is a deeper level. I mentioned the story a few times, and I will tell the story again. He'll survive. <laughs> was a Hasid in New York in the 1940s. He came, he came to America in the 1930s, late 1930s. He came to do, he was, came from Europe. He was sent by the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe. His name was Rabbi Shmuel Levitin. He came to fundraise in America and to spread Hasidus. And he stayed in America, and the Rebbe told him, stay longer, stay longer, stay longer, stay longer. Stay longer. He got caught, the war broke out, he didn't go back to Europe. His wife and his, and some of his kids, I think, perished in the Holocaust. Okay. He lived in 770 from then until he passed away, I think in 1973 or 74, something like this. He lived a long life by himself in a small room in 770. Very wise man, big, very important scholar, the story was uh, one of the donors to the yeshiva came to start to, to tell the yeshiva how to do things. He was, he was the chief uh, mashpia, it's called, of the yeshiva, mentor. And this guy called, this rabbi called this donor who came to, to tell people, to tell the, the, the principals out around the yeshiva and told them, come, come here. Said, how much you donated to yeshiva? He said, I donated more from you. He said, I'm for 10 years not taking a salary. I don't need much more than you. Don't tell us what to do. You want to give your donation? Give. If not, have a nice day. Then this Hossi, the 1943, 44, somewhere around this time, he was asked by the Hasidim in Chicago, there was a big Chabad group in Chicago at that time, to come to visit. The previous Rebbe at that time was already sick and paralyzed and he couldn't travel. They asked him to come to bring some spirit, inspiration. At that time, the biggest supporters of Chabad were in Chicago. That was the biggest community. Before he went to Chicago, he walked in, he went into the previous Lubavitch Rebbe for a blessing and directions. What should he do in Chicago? He walked into um, to his office. It was on the second floor in 770, Eastern Parkway. Anybody who was there knows what I'm talking about. And he, asked, he tells the Rebbe he's going to Chicago. The Rebbe told him like this, you know, there is a... In Chicago, there is somebody, a descendant from a Hasidic family. His name is Listner, Mr. Listner. And you know, I want you to go to visit him, to bring him around. Remind him his roots, from where he's coming. Fine. At that time, they traveled to Chicago by train. He was sitting in New York, he went to Chicago. In Chicago, there was a whole delegation of rabbis waiting for this famous rabbi from New York who is coming to visit them for a week, for two, I don't know how long it was. He gets off the train, he tells them, 
I'm going to Mr. Listener. We're not going anywhere. Straight to Mr. Listener. The Rebbe told me to go to Mr. Listener. I'm going straight to Mr. Listener. He says, is he coming to shul? He said, they tell him, yeah. He has a seat in shul. He's not coming too often to shul. And the high holidays, you see him sometimes. Before long, Mr. Listener is sitting in his office and a delegation of rabbis walks in the middle of the day out of nowhere. He didn't know from where they fell on him. He said, never saw this. He was, a, he was a rabbi with a long white beard and very hooked. He said, down, this rabbi, Shmuel of Shmuel of Eating, knew Mr. Listener's father and grandfather from Europe. He started telling stories about his father, about his grandfather. It was an unbelievable visit. It was, he was inspired. It was amazing. And by the end of the visit, Mr. Listener pulls out his checkbook and he's asking from which, for what name to write his, his uh, check. What organization? He told them, put your back to check book back in, in inside. I didn't come here for money. He says, and what is an old rabbi came from New York to drink a cup of coffee in my office? <laughs> <laughs> he told them, listen, you know, in Europe, in every shtetl used to be, uh, everyone had a Torah. People had film, mezuzahs. Now, every mezuzah film or Torah, how it's written? in compartment. Therefore, often, the letters, after the years, the letters are being erased. That's why you need to check them and to fix them. That's the type of the scribe that he goes around, he's to open the Torahs, check them out, check mezuzahs, we check the mezuzahs every year, that film, and so on. But in the Stettlach, small towns in Europe, one town could not support, did not have enough business for a scribe. What he did? He traveled around. One week he was in this place, another week he was in this place. And he fixed. That's how he made a living. The Rabbi Levitin tells him, I'm a traveling scribe. He says, you see, and every Jew, every Jew is a Torah. It's written in the, in the Talmud that the word Israel, Israel, is, is an acronym for Yesh Shishim Ribo Otiot La Torah. The Torah is 600,000 letters. It means to say that every Jew has a letter in the Torah. He said, sometimes some letter get, get erased. A letter of kosher gets erased. The letter of, uh, of uh, Tfil, Shabbat, uh, some letters get erased. And my job is to go travel around town and to fix the letters, to correct them, to add some ink to the letters. He obviously loved the explanation and they parted in very good. It was a very nice meeting. Fine, after a week or two, Rabbi Levitin comes back to New York. First thing he's doing, he's going to the previous Rebbe to give him a report of the visit. He walks in, he was very close with the Rebbe. Probably the, to the previous Rebbe, probably the closest host in the details to the previous Rebbe. He comes in, the Rebbe told him, I don't know, you were by Mr. Listener? He said, yes. How was it? He started to tell them about the story. He came in and he this, and he wanted to give him a check. He, done, he told them the explanation that I told them that we are like a Torah, there's a, every Jew is a Torah, and there is some letters get erased. And he was very excited about this explanation. It was, he felt very good about it. And he saw that the Rebbe was sitting like this. <laughs> he knew from the face that the Rebbe was not excited about the explanation. That he asked the Rebbe, like, we kind of, he didn't have to ask, he just looked at well, where I got wrong, well, what is not right here? The Rebbe told them there is two types of writing. There is otiot activa, letters that you write, writing. And there is letters that you engrave. The Torah is two separate things. You take ink, you put on parchment, and you write it. Because there are two separate things, they can be get erased. Engraving the letters that are on the two tablets, the Ten Commandments and the tablets. You engrave them, right? They were engraved. When you engrave letters on stone, they can never be erased. Never. They're there. Forever and ever. I so told them, the Torah, the way it's written in the parchment, is ink and parchment. The Torah that's written in a Jewish soul is like the two tablets coming out to Shavuos. You have the tablets, right? The tablets are engraved, the letters are engraved in the tablets. So too the Torah with the Jew are the letters are engraved in the Jew. 
he can never get rid of it. It's a part of him. What could only happen from time to time? It gets dusty. There's dust accumulating under the dust. And we told him, our job is to go around and clean the dust. But we don't have to write a new letter. We don't have to introduce a new concept. The moment you clean the doors, the letter comes out shining. The moment you wake up the Jew, the letter comes out clear and shining. That's the letters that we're talking about. Bechukotai is the same word as hakika, engraved letters. Then God wants from us that the letters should be engraved in our soul. It should be a part of us. How we accomplish it? That when a little child learns to, in Judaism, learns Shema Israel and he learns Modani, and he learns the prayers, and he learns stories about God and the Bible and the Tzaddikim, this is engraved in his soul. No matter where he will go, he will never be able to shake this off. That will be a part of him. And that's why Jewish education at a young age is so important, more important than everything. And that's why day schools, so any preschools, anything Jewish that will give a strong Jewish education, or not only preschools and day schools, parents, grandparents, tell the kids stories about God and about the Torah and about the Jewish people, and teach them prayers and celebrate them holidays. This is engraved in them and will never uh, leave them.